What was the FINRA arbitration? This was litigated in Cook County Circuit Court. It was, uh, yeah, New Edge, um, our client, Scout Trading was a uh, uh, essentially a trading vehicle put together by a, uh, a professional money manager in New York. They were trading on the uh, London Metal Exchange. They had, they, they in turn hired a, a manager in London uh, that, that lost a lot of money for them uh, on the metal ex- uh, on the London Metal Exchange. And um, they decided they were going to sue the clearing broker uh, for their losses. And even though they were a professional advisor hiring another professional advisor, and, and New Edge's only role was to clear the trades. They By the time they sued New Edge, uh, the, the arbitration agreement in the customer agreement said you could have NFA arbitration or FINRA arbitration, as the customer may elect, which which is typical in a lot of agreements because um, you know that's the CFTC rule on, um, on on arbitration agreements that you have to give the customer choices in the in the agreement, and so they had signed that. By the time they brought the case, NFA was uh, this the two year limitation of NFA was already passed, so they they couldn't bring it at NFA. They brought it at FINRA, which is I think five-year limitation period, and we said, "Well, no, but this is futures. You can't really bring it in Finra uh, because they their their jurisdiction is limited to securities contracts um, and our securities disputes that arise out of the business of securities." And there was an issue there about, "Well, doesn't that make this useless for a futures agreement?" And we said, "No, because New Edge clears security futures agreements, the single stock futures. So if someone..." had had a dispute with um, single stock futures, they could have gone to FINRA on it. But this was Met- London Metal Exchange, which was, which was was pure futures and no no securities involved. And, and we don't think um, that it's covered. And because the NFA uh, statute is over with, you guys are out of luck. We actually prevailed at the circuit court level. The judge agreed with us that it wasn't covered by the arbitration agreement, but then um, they took it up on appeal and the appellate court disagreed and said, yes, you have an agreement and you have to abide by it. And FINRA was willing to take it um, uh, because I, I don't I don't I don't think they want to get in the middle of that type of dispute. They they would really let the parties decide, you know, decide that type of dispute on their own. And, and, and New Edge was a, a FINRA member. Um, and so we, we ended up having to go to arbitration in, in, in New York FINRA. But uh, we we eventually did prevail on that one, and and so uh, uh, the customer, it, because it really it really was a pure case of a clearing broker just doing nothing but clearing for them, and in a a uh, you know one professional advisor hiring another professional advisor and wanting to make the clearing broker liable for it. Um, so that that was uh, that that was that was an interesting. I think I think the arbitration part of it was was. Kind of an interesting legal issue um, that you know. Obviously, the court, the trial court, disagreed from the appellate court, but the appellate court trumps the tri- trial court. So, so we did lose on that one. Do you have a favorite case? In some ways, uh, it was that um, First Amendment case because I, I don't think I ever did any other First Amendment cases. <laughs> and uh, I mean, the courtroom was filled because. Uh, all these University of Chicago students were there because they had all briefed the case, and it was a it was a really interesting case on, on you know that that had broad application on, on administrative law because normally you cannot you cannot challenge an investigation. You have to wait till the investigation's over, till the claim is over, and it's been decided, and then you could go back and say no, I'm right, and and because of the First Amendment aspect to it, and the the speech chilling aspect which we proved. You know, the Court of Appeals uh, agreed with us after after the um, uh, U.S. District Court had had uh, had ruled against us, and uh, um, so I, I think I just I think given given our wide <laughs> so many of these cases, nobody's watching it except the people involved. In this case, had a had a big courtroom filled with uh, University of Chicago students who would who would you know brief both sides of it. I think as a, a class exercise. What were the CFTC lawyers like? Some CFTC lawyers who can really get to the heart of things and come to uh, really, you know, reasonable dispositions of cases. 
you know, without causing undue pain, let's say, to uh, um, to to the subjects of the investigation, uh, which I think is fair for everyone. Um, I, I was disappointed when the law changed, and I, I don't know if you recall this, but in the original Commodity Exchange Act, fines in CFTC cases were required to be done with a view to allowing people to remain in business. And that was eliminated from the act at some point along the way. Uh, and I think the philosophy in the beginning, in the early days, was more, hey, we want we want to bring these cases to discipline you, to teach you a lesson when you aren't complying with the rules, but we don't want to drive you out of business. And I think as time went on, it became a matter of we want to extract as much money and pain as we can uh, on the part of some you know, of the attorneys that felt that was going to advance their careers. I don't want to dump on the CFTC lawyers because I think they're very professional people and, and I had good relationships with them throughout. I mean, you're dealing with the same people all the time. I'm just saying some people, and I and I would I would try to, you know, charitably chalk it up to inexperience more than malevolence <laughs> that, you know, really overdo things uh, to an extent that didn't, didn't need to be done to really serve the interests of, of 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 their own client the cftc in in you know in really achieving a decent result what is it like when they become defenders i think that's very common it, you know if you're not on the cftc side you're going to be on the defense side and so uh those that do go into private practice i mean some of them have gone into in-house work um and others have uh you know gone into defense work but i mean it, it's not it's not a hard um change for them they they i mean it's it's sort of the way in in criminal law where people uh you know are prosecutors and and kind of learn the ropes in the prosecutor's offices state's attorney or u.s attorney and then then go on to be defense attorney i was probably the exception to the rule that i never worked you know for the government in that sense myself i i picked it all up in private practice with you know a year and a half as in-house counsel uh, uh on loan um, and uh, so I learned the industry that way, being in-house counsel and being on the premises of a, a brokerage firm all the time. Uh, but but I would say the vast majority of the defense lawyers did work for the CFTC ahead of time, and, and they do just fine going into the uh, on the other side of it. And and, and they they've got relationships with the CFTC lawyers and and know the regulations, which is really what you need to do to to be involved in this type of litigation. Does regulation by enforcement work or push people out of the business? I don't think it's good for the industry, but I don't think it's what's driving people out. I think it's the capital requirements more than uh, the regulation, because um, I, th I think that when, when you look at the firms that existed when I started, most of them were in Chicago. A lot of them were family owned uh, or or owned by agricultural businesses who wanted a, a you know a futures firm as a subsidiary. Most of the larger firms now are, are bank owned, and I think it's because of the capital requirements, which, uh, you know, you just can't afford. And, you know, uh, it's very difficult for people to afford. Um, I think the problem with the regulation um, is a little different. It's that the CFTC can end up making bad law through their enforcement decisions uh, because we used to take a lot more of these to trial when it when it was. The way it used to be, as I described, where uh, they weren't so much out to drive you out of business as they were to prove a point and 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 uh, you know get a fine that teach you a lesson, but not necessarily put you out of business. People were much more willing to go to trial on these, and and that's a good way to make law. I mean, one of the earlier judges, um, Judge Shipe of the CFTC Administrative Law Judge, wrote a, a law review article many years ago about how these administrative proceedings at the CFTC was really a good way to make law because, um, you, you know, there would be an adversary process. People would, you know, bring forth their various um, positions. The judge would decide it was subject to review by the CFTC. Ultimately, it could go to court if somebody disagreed there. And, and using the adversarial process, you'd make a lot of good case law. Um, with with these big fines, what, what, you, what you find, I think, is you know, large firms can afford the fines, and it's cheaper than hiring lawyers to fight it, frankly. The CFTC writes up the decision in a way um, that the 
defendant is willing to agree to that states really aggressive positions on the law, which I don't think would necessarily hold up in an adversary process. And then, of course, everybody looks at those decisions and says, well, we better follow these because this is the, what the CFTC thinks the law is. And it just I, I think it skews the law in in a in a unfair position that it wouldn't be if more of these cases went to trial. But with with with, with the amount of fines that they're trying to seek, it, it just becomes not a very good economic decision in a lot of times to to go to trial and and. and, and try to prevail in that manner the way, the way we used to a lot more.